We are now ready to resume our third session. This is all about the power sector. The energy grid, the, natu uh, the national mix is of course has been of key concern and one of the key objectives, one of the key challenges before the present government. The discourse around energy and how do we make sure that there's uninterrupted energy supply to the citizens of Pakistan for present and for future needs and also to keep in mind how sustainable our way forward is. Is. What is the carbon footprint? What is the environmental impact of it? And how do we make sure that we sort of stitch in all the other overlapping fields? A number of our speakers have spoken about how Pakistan needs to increase its exports. But in the last 10 years, 15 years, a repeatedly you know, recorded problem, reported problem has been how the manufacturers have had an energy deficit. This shortage has really costed Pakistan. So what will be the way forward? Ladies and gentlemen, may I welcome my very insightful, very pertinent panel for this conversation. Please welcome our moderator for, the, for this conversation, Mr. Aftab Muhammad Bhatt. You are the CEO of CAPCO. Aftab Saab will be leading this very insightful panel and of course all the major players and key players in the Pakistan energy sector are also represented on this panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Chief Executive of K Electric Limited, Sayed Munis Abdullah Alvi. Next up, please welcome Professor Dr. Fayaz Chaudhry. You are the Professor and Director at Lums Energy Institute and the Program Director at the Power Sector Center of Excellence and also the CEO of Engineers Guild Private Limited. Next up, please welcome the CEO of Lucky Electric Power Company, Mr. Ruhail Mohammed. Please also welcome the CEO of Engro Energy Limited, Essen Zafar Said. Let's also welcome our moderator of the past session, but a speaker in this one. Please welcome the founder and CEO of Planative, Ayla Majeed. Aftab Sab, over to you. This panel discussion is themed at fixing Pakistan's power sector the way forward. And uh, right about the last five minutes, the timer will play for your perusal. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. पावर सेक्टर का भी बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज है कि वो फिक्स नहीं हो सका और हमें एक और चैलेंज मिल गया कि हमारा टाइम स्क्वीज होके 40 मिनट्स हो गया सो वी विल बी गोइंग टू बी वेरी ब्रीफ ऑन इट जस्ट टू गिव लिटिल बिट ऑफ बैकग्राउंड व्हाट वी हैव पाकिस्तान वेन थ्रू अ लॉट ऑफ प्रॉब्लम इन टर्म्स ऑफ एनर्जी आल जूस अ वर्ड एनर्जी बिकॉज दैट आल्सो इंक्लूड द गैस लाइट इन पर्टिकुलर पावर सेक्टर एंड इन टर्म्स once we had 65% share of uh, hydro and 35% rest, now the equation has uh, switched over. Uh, at this point of time, uh, you remember uh, in around 2012, we used to have a shortfall of about 10,000 megawatt and uh, load shedding of 10 to 12 hours. And now we are sitting in a situation where we have kind of surplus and uh, we are trying to find uh, areas where we can sell the electricity. Having said that, uh, that's uh, the situation right now. Uh, I have, just to give a background, a proper ground for my panelists, very able, to, uh, which I'm going to introduce, uh, a little bit of uh, the numbers which we are right now and in the next five years. And that will give you uh, some ideas that what are we going to face in the next five years. I was very particular about uh, the title of this conference and my intent that uh, it should not just be the discussion, but we should also be able to find one, two, three in terms of our understanding, the solution that uh, uh, the sector or the decision maker should take uh, to resolve the issue. And before I give you four or five slides, I'd like to introduce Munis uh, and you have already done it. I think I should skip on this. Uh, you can see the title, and uh, this is the first one. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm just going to quickly run through it. Uh, we have uh, 4,777 megawatts and Munis will uh, definitely going to speak about it. 
35,000, roughly uh, 36,000 megawatt in the rest of the system, dependable capacity 33,000, 31 million users, 10 discos, 123. The important point that you should keep in mind uh, for now discussion and later, that the average tariff is 18, uh, which NEPRA have determined, and the average consumer is 17, and so there's an inbuilt shortfall in the tariff and the recovery. And this is beside uh, the line losses and the non-recoverability of the system. This is uh, this information I obtained from the system, so roughly it's accurate. You would see this is the uh, generation mix that we have, and if you look at the bottom line, uh, we have generated 130,000 gigawatt in the last year, and the average EPP, energy purchase price, which is the true pro uh, manufacturing, that is 5.2, whereas the capacity payment, which we normally understand is a fixed payment that uh, has to be paid in any case is 6.1. The average cost was 6.33. This is the main area of bleeding. These are, apart from the Karachi Electric, these are the distribution companies which we normally call discos. You would see that uh, overall they bought 121 million uh, gigawatts of R and they were able to sell 99. That means 21.745 uh, is the lost number of units which could have generated revenue. And for these units, you have to still pay. The percentages of losses, uh, I mean, actual losses, you would see 21,000, 17.9. And the most important, which probably one of the uh, most important cause of the stuck up money and the circular debt, the total receivable from these by the distribution companies, 1.2 trillion. Here, our money is stuck. If that is recovered, our system would be in much better situation. It would be liquid and are probably, they would have a positive reflection on the cost of generation. And future, this is what we're gonna face, and I'm gonna to speak to my panelists on it. You look at that, uh, we were talking about the capacity payment. In uh, 2030, the capacity payment would increase to 2.4 billion. Remind you, this payment has to be made irrespective of you are generating or not. And the anticipated uh, EPP is 764. I'll speak about it, why this is important, later on. This is the capacity payment, future outlook, how our unit gonna be expensive more uh, in the future, so future, we have to address right now, and this is thanks. This is just to give uh, sort of a ground for our panelists to discussion. Uh, I have um, my very dear friend and my petty bhai, uh, Moniz, with me, and I am particularly a very great fan, not just because he's sitting, but uh, the way the guys are uh, handling Karachi Electric and the innovation and the other investment part they are doing. I request uh, Munis, uh, I mean, Gay is, is always in uh, the news, and I personally know that you guys are doing a lot of stuff. Can you give us a quick rundown that how you have achieved and good part that you have uh, are at present, and for five, 10 years for the customers, how you're gonna change, evolve, or improve for the benefit of the end customers? Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, Aftab, Aftab, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, at the same time, I would really like to congratulate uh, uh, Aswar Essen Saab, who now has an added advantage of being the state minister uh, for investment. But I am sure if he would have not been uh, the BOI chairman uh, or minister, the, the traction that he has created would still be in the same. So I think it's a fantastic effort and important for all of us to, uh, you know, sit, debate, and talk about how to take things forward um, in this challenging environment. Uh, again, coming back to K Electric, uh, and one thing which we have tried to uh, explain to people, and again, uh, with <laughs> utmost respect, the K in K Electric is not Karachi. It is Kinetic. And the 
the main reason of not having it as Karachi is that because we are not only restricted to Karachi, we are in Uthal, Vindar, Vela, and we are at up to Gharo. And there is a conversation happening to take that network even beyond Uthar, Vela, in uh, deep into Balochistan because it is uh, not too cost effective for the Quetta Electric to extend its network close to this. So probably, maybe at some point in time, that area can also increase. So again, uh, K is not for Karachi, it's for Kinetic. Useful. <laughs> so the journey, and I think uh, so many people in this room uh, are aware of the challenges, and you know, we, have, we have repeated it again and again, and we don't, don't want to do it again. But I think the, the future in my opinion, and I'll still say it, it is privatization of the distribution companies. Yes, there are problems. We have seen the numbers. We know that there's going to be excess capacity. Uh, we know that there's going to be amount which have to be paid. But at the end of the day, if the distribution system is not in a position to transport those electrons which are available and sell it or distribute it and record those units in line with what has been prescribed by the regulator and then collect to the extent it is allowed to them. You know, you probably would know the cost of power generation. Today, if you look at uh, discos, including K-Electric, the, uh, the tariff asks for a 100% recovery ratio almost, which is impossible. So, there are a lot of costs which are going into the circular debt, which is again uh, a huge elephant in the room, which, is, which has to be resolved. I think what the government is trying to do, and again the future five years or seven years, uh, is dependent on uh, the CTBCM, and I'm sure my colleagues uh, in this panel will talk about it, the integrated generation plan, efficiency plan. I think these documents were not there initially, and, and, and you, know, uh, you know this much better than I am, is that these documents are there, you can look at it, you can comment on it, you can say that CTBCM has these challenges, but now at least you have the opportunity to comment on it and improve it. It might take a bit longer, uh, it might not be implemented in the manner it is presented today, but I think the future is deregulation, the future is, uh, you, you ha and, and we have tried this, and um, you know, if I have the opportunity, I'll talk, talk again uh, in the second question or later, that digitization is a very important thing which everyone has to do, and, and KE has done tremendous, you can see our app, and we are trying to take it to the next level where you would know if there is a fault, uh, where is the car, which is going to fix that fault. How much time will it take? It will require a lot of you know, tracking of things, which we are still doing. But if you look at the other discos, let me tell you, and I'm sure you guys must have seen the NAPRA reports, they're saying it's virtually manual. Uh, the numbers are not too much generated from the systems, and that it is very important that you have those uh, uh, systems to be implemented. It will require money, it will require people, so uh, while you know we, we claim that privatization is the solution, but is it possible with all these manual things? So I think digitization, circular debt, handling of circular debt, planning. The reason why we have excess capacity, you know, one can say that you added power without looking at the future. One can debate that the plants were, or the plan was okay, but the growth did not come. But fine, now we have the opportunity to predict the future and come up with plans so that we should not be in a position to uh, do the same what we did uh, in our previous power policies. Uh, the renewables is a reality. Uh, I think this is being done and, and the government has an aggressive policy, K-Electric itself. You know, we, inshallah, uh, in the next five to seven years, we would have at least 20 to 25 percent uh, power generated from renewables. It is re going to reduce the cost. It is going to reduce the import impact. Uh, and again, uh, you know, this is going to help us 
reduce the carbon emissions, which again is, you know, we, uh, as, a, as a nation, uh, probably we are okay, but as a country, probably you need to help the nature to help you. So these are the few things which, you know, we would like to uh, do SK Electric also and uh, would like to see uh, from uh, the government policy perspective also. Thank you very much. I think uh, you rightly mentioned and referred to a structural approach towards the betterment of the any sector, in particular the power sector. And you rightly mentioned that now we have uh, documents relating to CTBCM and uh, IGSAP integrated generation plan. And, and we have the privilege to have Dr. Saab with us who has worked in the system and uh, who could be considered one of the pioneer to develop a structural approach towards the generation and transmission and the distribution system. Dr. Sub, may I request, I think this uh, Monis Sub uh, referred to the very relevant point. Uh, we were ha having a discussion that, you know, the fact of the matter is now we have what we have uh, for the right and wrong reason, and we are looking into the future. So may I request, how do you look into the planning thing and how we should look into the future addressing these constraints now? Actually when we talk about fixing you know, power sector, unless and until we look at the overall structure of the power sector, how it is governed, what are the elements that we are trying to govern, uh, those things have to be looked at. So we mentioned a few numbers in the slides. Uh, and then we spoke about that we will need to fix uh, discos uh, for sure. So they incur uh, quite a few losses more than they should. But uh, the major flaw that we have been living with, we have not been making informed decisions. So that is what you know, my focus is. That we need to create an environment where we start making informed decisions. What, what do I mean by informed decisions? That we have the skill and, and the capability uh, in 80s as well as uh, you know, 90s uh, to develop an integrated system and resource plan which was missing you know, for the last uh, 20 odd years and now we started making it again but still we lack uh, you know, the capacity uh, in the sector which can develop that plan uh, professionally and equitably. So you know, that uh, you know, at LUMS, we have started that effort of capacity building of power sectors. So nowadays, uh, quite a few, you know, uh, advanced technical training courses are being uh, held at LUMS uh, for the, especially for, uh, you know, the uh, state-owned entities. And later on, we will invite the private sector also, IPPs, to learn uh, some of the decision-making process that the industry uh, requires. And I will start with uh, the regulator. What do we, you know, are we, you know, regulating this power sector correctly? If you would have been doing it, we would have been, uh, would, we wouldn't have been in this uh, circular debt situation. And we need to understand that this disco is one portion. Overall, maybe 100 billion rupees are lost. Uh, you know, total loss is about 150, and you cannot avoid some of the technical losses. Maybe 100 billion is lost in the recovery or in the extra losses. But we need to be mindful that we supplied last year, or, you know, the, you know uh, four years ago, same sort of energy. Uh, we, you know, uh, just looked at the number 130 terawatt hours. And we supplied 122, 122, and 122 in the last four years. But our capacity payment grew from 400 to 1,000 billion. So 600 billion rupees were added into the capacity payment for the supply of same energy. So what does this mean? So what is adding to the circular debt? Is it only the losses? Are 500 billion extra added, which we didn't uh, you know, plan it well. So the focus should be that we need to follow processes. We need to get away from that. 
we need to follow a process. And we need to make ourselves process bound. So there is a process of a grid code. It has been there forever, you know, but we never followed it. That's why we, you know, for 10, 12 years, we were in deficit. Now we are in surplus. So the going forward, the recommendation is follow the process. And whoever violates that process, hang him. Simple. So, you know, <laughs> you know, otherwise, you know, the, uh, you just look at how many people suffer. So, the, you know, the 230 million people are suffering because of the higher cost of electricity and their industry is, you know, affected. So, whatever process we have, we have processes for integrated in, in the grid code, integrated system plan, but then the how to get out of this, ease of doing business. Our base load even today sits at 8,000 megawatt, which was for the last seven years, it was 7,000. Just last year and this year, it has increased a bit. And our peak demand is 25, 26 only on the NTDC system. If you, you, know, uh, you know, include 3,500 or you know, almost 4,000 megawatt of K-Electric, so our peak demand is 29 or 30,000 megawatt. And your base load is of, for the whole country is not even 10,000. So what is this disparity? So it means whatever we will build, our overall capacity factor, utilization factor is very low. And our, when I was, you know, uh, I joined, you know, WAPDA in uh, uh, 85, our industrial demand was 40% of the mix. And now it is only 22. So what does that mean? So it means at load end, we need to increase our load. Only then we can get out of this circular debt. So our focus has to be so connect everybody, whoever, yes, recovery is important, but giving connections, timely connections. And the industry is longing for, now they know that there is a good environment that industry has, you know, the, the, I see there a lot of investment is coming. But the thing is, are we making their life easy? Are we making their supply reliable? So those are the focus points for future that we need to uh, like electrical vehicles and induction heating, you know, we, you know, lose our, you know, gas, which is already scarce, uh, just 10, uh, 15 to 20 percent efficiency in cooking. But the thing is, we have 62 percent efficiency power plant sitting there, and we are not operating it. For God's sake, you know, when are we going to learn? And this disparity between the peak load and the base load, what is that load? Are we, have we gone to you know, vacation in these four months? No. So we have not gone uh, to vacation, but for the, this 14 to 15,000 megawatt of, which is a cooling load, air conditioning, fan and all that, how much, you know, did we even you know, look at what our building designs are? Are they energy efficient? So those are the focus areas, instead of keep adding, you know, additional generation, we need to look at things in, tot in totality. So anyway, excellent. so I'll have excellent, my chance, excellent, hopefully. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lots of made excellent points. Uh, and uh, uh, let me confess that we have the opportunity to discuss these things. And he mentioned about the peak demand and the low, uh, lowest demand or base demand. Uh, yes, that's, and we, Pakistan is one of the very few country where peak demand and the base load or the lowest, uh, the point has a greatest disparity. Normally, uh, average is 25% from peak and the lowest points or you say the average system utilization. Unfortunately, Pakistan has this problem and therefore when we have a problem uh, of uh, electricity shortfall, we suffer the most. Yes, in, uh, for example, transitionary time when uh, you are moving from summer to uh, winter, winter to summer, uh, the heating and the cooling load uh, gets down and then you have less demand. So good point, uh, Dr. Uh, made. I think we will uh, discuss it uh, further. Uh, Rohel, 
uh, one of my very good friends. I mean, circular debt, I mean, such a big name, and I think in Pakistan, you ask anybody and uh, whether he can read or write, you would know the circular debt. You have worked and you have uh, been involved in implementation of a lot of very good project and very good team. Uh, I would like to ask you the circular debt, which is no more circular now, but having said that, the amount is increasing like anything. And uh, every second year or year, we are sitting in front of the Ministry of Finance and Power asking for the money for the bills that, uh, for the electricity which has been sold like two years back. So would you like to sort of throw a light and a solution if you can please? Thank you, Aftar. Asalaamu Alaikum. So uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, circular debt arises when the total receipts and payments between the entire power sector don't match. It's as simple as that. So if you are recovering say 100 rupees and you have to pay 120 rupees, the 20 rupees gets added on to the overall circular debt. So the main body which is doing this is the CPPA, which is the Central Power Purchasing Agency, which collects money through the discourse from the customers, direct consumers. It gets money from the subsidy from the Ministry of Finance as well, and then has to pay uh, all the power producers plus you know, capital expenditure to maintain the system, overheads, etc. So this, where is the circular debt parked? It's parked in government entities, it's parked in power plants, it's parked in uh, fuel suppliers like PSO, OGDC, SNGPL. So what, and what's the quantum? The quantum, as you, as you said, is about two and a half trillion rupees right now, and has increased from 1.2 when uh, the, this government came in. So you're adding about 400 billion a year uh, in this entire system. Now, there are many uh, reasons for it. Some are direct, some are indirect. Some have been already been uh, touched upon, so I'll just quickly go through them and uh, start talking about solutions as well. So the first one which we talked about is the disco inefficiencies. So NEPRA allows certain uh, losses uh, or non-recoveries, but in actuality, these are substantially more. So for example, NEPRA allows about 13 and 14% on TND, which is another name for theft, uh, but the actual number is 18. NEPRA says zero uh, losses as far as recovery is concerned, and the average is around 10% uh, for the country, They're collecting 90 out of 100. So if you add this two uh, versus the NEPRA benchmark, we're looking at about 200 billion rupees a year. Now, this can't be achieved immediately, but as Moniz was mentioning, privatization is probably one of the solutions. You call it whatever, you call it management contracts, call it privatization, but it has to go out of public sector control for it uh, to happen. And also it won't happen overnight. I mean, for example, K Electric took 15 years to go from 36 to I think 15, 16. So it's a five, seven year type of uh, target that slowly, Bangladesh, by the way, has gone from like 36 to 11 in, in about 20 years. So these are the things that need to be done as far as, so privatization, management contracts, that's number one. Uh, number two is that we talked about capacity payments, right? Now, what happened five, seven years ago when there was load shedding, uh, two things. One is that the utilization of those power plants because the capacity was so low was very high. Uh, so in the summer, your demand is 25, you're only generating 18 and there's so much uh, load shedding. Plus, at those times, the debt servicing was complete, so there was no debt servicing component on that capacity payment. Today, because we have so much capacity, like 35,000, your de peak demand is 26, average is about 20, 22. For each unit of capacity, it's being doubled because being loaded on to uh, two units as such. And on top of that, it's all our brand new plants, especially the CPAC and the 2015 plants. So there's heavy debt servicing, especially in dollar terms with DVAL. So this problem will remain. It's almost a trillion, and as Aftab said, that it will go on to two trillion as well. There are two or three solutions to this. One is, of course, as Dr. Saab mentioned, is the demand. And demand comes from many ways. One is like for, uh, just to the heating demand uh, in, in the winters. So example, SNGPL, the demand just for heating alone is like 800 million standard cubic feet of, per day. Now, if you can theoretically convert that into electrical heating, that's the amount of gas you will save also, and that much more, uh, maybe three, 4,000 megawatts will get utilized. 
similarly, to move captive power plants onto the grid. Obviously, one is a pricing incentive, uh, but the other one is quality, which I think the discos have to step up, including K Electric, and provide sustainable, reliable power, and only then they will shift into uh, grid power as such. The third element is, of course, uh, putting the grid where there are 25% unserved customers out here. So the one way is to electrify and let the natural demand grow as well. So for this captive, for these capacity payments, I think there are these three for the uh, winter load, the captive, and natural growth. I think these are the solutions for utilizing the uh, capacity payments as such. There are other reasons also. For example, the, there is a certain amount of subsidy which the government uh, wants you to give to the either the lifeline consumers or uh, the tube wells or someone somewhere in Balochistan. But they don't fully budget for it, and even if they do, it's not paid timely. So that keeps on adding on to the, uh, to the system as well. Similarly, NEPRA, there's a NEPRA role with the, any adjustment in price has to be notified immediately, but they take the sweet time. By the time it is notified, there's a six-month gap on actual cost versus the recovery. So that keeps on adding. So NEPRA has to play its due role. The ministry has to play its due role to do that. Uh, Another big number which is there is the interest on the old amount. So this two and a half, two point five trillion, the interest is part of the loading up in, in the power tariff as such. I think once the flow of circular debt stops, I think then the Ministry of Finance will have confidence that the problem has been re resolved. So the back stock can then be taken up at the budget level. So maybe if we are running three trillion rupees a year deficits, Maybe a trillion each in two years can be taken up by the federal government. The interest alone on those two trillion will be 200 billion and then you can yeah. balance your uh, flow. I think the final point I have is in terms of the distribution network. Uh, because the, uh, in certain Punjab areas, we have the power, but we don't have the distribution network and you're seeing load shedding there. So once we resolve that, a lot more power can be taken up there and we can stop running RFO plants which are inefficient. I think I'll stop there too. Uh, thank you very much. And I think you very rightly addressed one of my own concern being the finance guy, that uh, there is a unproductive uh, add-on into the tariff. And if you just uh, charge 10% on two trillion, is 200 uh, billion, which is added into the tariff. Whether it's added and uh, transferred to the consumer or not, somebody has to bear this cost, which is non-productive, it's a past. Uh, even that you have to carry on. And government has to seriously think about it to structure or adjust it somewhere. Uh, otherwise, it'll keep adding its uh, elephant in the room, which will remain so. So thank you very much, Rohail. And uh, Essence, uh, sir, you and your organization has been involved um, into many innovative ideas and uh, and you guys have entered into the coal generation as well, and you guys are into the gas side as well. So what would your, be your idea of liberalization and uh, improving the power sector overall? Thank you, uh, Bhatshap, and uh, first of all, thank you, Asfarasan, for inviting me to this forum. Um, Bhatshap, for liberalization, I think I must first uh, define what the problem is. The problem that we are facing in the entire uh, power value chain, if you divide the power value chain, it has around seven big components to it, starting from fuel, uh, then you know generation, transmission, distribution, demand, cost, and others. In each of this component, there is an issue. So you can list down a number of issues, but you have to force rank them. What is the biggest issue and what needs to be resolved? Rohil just elaborated on the biggest issue, which is related to distribution. And in this particular item, distribution, the issue is of circular debt, which is you know, 60%, 55 to 60% of you know, disco losses are contributing towards circular debt. But after that, what is the issue? The second issue is the surplus power. And the surplus power issue is coming from 
lack of planning or lack of having an independent planning body. And then comes the demand issue and the cost issue. And it's a chicken and egg situation, whether the demand is low because of the high cost or the cost is high because of lack of demand. So the question that you have asked about liberalization actually addresses this. First, we need to address the disco issues or the you know, efficiency losses of the discos. But the second thing is, we need to understand that up till now, the government is relying on a single buyer model. Single buyer model, a monopolistic market, the whole risk is with the government. Government has made many attempts. Uh, several of them have been failed attempts and recently a lot of attempts were made and there have been some results, some benefits coming out of it like, you know, the winter package, the industrial package and things of that sort. But in spite of making all these efforts, the issues are not going away. So we need to see where the world is going, what is the global trend or what is the trend in, you know, comparable markets. And the trend is to move away from a monopolistic single buyer, bar, single buyer market to a multiple buyer and a multiple seller market, moving away towards liberalization, moving towards a free market. And once this happens, once the free market happens, the market forces adjust themselves. And then you'll have competition, you'll have efficiency, and therefore the cost will come down and the reliability will come in. Very recently, uh, we, our company, has embarked upon uh, uh, MOU with Government of Sin, where we have said that, look, um, government has set uh, two uh, big statements as part of their vision. One is renewables, you know, making renewables, taking it to 30% by 2030, or taking it to 60% as a clean energy target. So that's one objective the government has defined, and the second objective they have defined is to move towards, uh, you know, opening up market. And CTBCM that we just heard, you know, is part of it. So uh, we have signed an MOU with Government of Sindh, which takes care of both these problems. Uh, uh, we are using the cluster of industries at Port Qasim, and we are, uh, you know, using resources at Jampir and connecting both of them through a dedicated uh, transmission line. And by doing this, perhaps both of the issues would be resolved. So what I want to say is that, in my opinion, uh, the way to go is resolve uh, disco issues, open up the market. Everyone is prepared for it. The regulator itself uh, is talking about it. Uh, Chairman Napra has said this on record many, many times that they want to open up the market and CTBCM is just around the corner and it's knocking on the door. It's, uh, it's a realization uh, which is going to happen. The recent result of ISCO extension in license is writing on the wall, so which means that the market is going to open up, if not in April, maybe after a couple of months, so it's just six months away. So CTBCM is coming, power sector is geared up, Government is talking about it. Something has to do proof of concept. Somebody has to come forward and take baby steps. And what we are suggesting is to get into bilateral contracts uh, with uh, BPC bulk power consumers and so that the price comes down. So my message to you, Batsab, would be that um, we must try and uh, we must not shy away and we must open up uh, this market as much as possible and go towards liberalization. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. A very pertinent point. I look quickly to you. Uh, you know, uh, I know that your renewable energy efficiency is very close to your heart. Just forget about the few minutes and you have the time to speak about it. You sit on CPPA board. So give us a fresh look because we are sitting in the power sector. And my attitude is somebody also should tell us that what to do, actually, as a user as well. Sure, Aftab, thank you so much. Um, I'll be very quick, but not brief. 
So I think the important thing to look at is that when we talk about power sector, if we just keep on finding the solution within the sector, it's going to be a challenge. Let's step, sort of take the helicopter view what the, um, uh, um, uh, what, the um, what the air chief said uh, in the morning. Let's sort of step out, zoom out, and see what is that we need to do. When we look at things in a holistic manner and look at that what is the need, what is the growth of all the other sector, be it uh, automotives, be it agriculture, be it technology, et cetera, in in, in, in all that context, we need to find a solution. Um, understanding the problem, I think it's a very good thing. As long as we recognize that all these problems exist and agreeing with all the solutions out there, there are some additional things that need to be done. I think talking about renewables, why it makes sense. We should not shy away from investing more in renewables thinking that we have overcapacity. Overcapacity can also be fixed when we can really drive the growth in the demand. How do we do that? Agriculture sector is there, the technology sector is there. Again, when we look at electric vehicles, IEA says that by 2030, there will be about 230 million cars, EVs on the, on the roads. Likewise, the kind of demand that we have, we are an agriculture country, we, we, we waste more than probably close to 30 or 40 percent of our agri produce because we don't have the right kind of supply supply chain we can use our energy over there as well and now talking about green energy why it makes sense again i believe in the principle of that we need to take a stakeholder approach whatever capacity was involved whatever system inefficiencies were there let's for a moment assume that everything was done with good intention and since this is a future summit, let's uh, move, move forward and look at that going forward, what is that we need, to, we, we need to do. We need to agree on the principle that the consumer needs sustainable, reliable, affordable energy. And at the same time, let's add more renewable in the grid and also off grid. In the last three decades, I know there's a, there's a, there's a lot of debate with regards to the base load, et cetera, et cetera. But when we look at the battery storage costs, in the last three decades, the battery storage costs have come, come down by 97%. And the next decade's projection is that it's gonna come down by further probably 60%. It just makes sense to go there. When we talk about uh, installing more renewables, now utilities scale photovoltaics and in the wind energy and all these experts, they would sort of, they can, they know more than myself that now, even without sustainable financial support, these projects um, and these technologies, they have become competitive to other fossil fuel uh, projects. So I think we need to sort of look at things from uh, the holistic perspective. Um, I, I would nevertheless just highlight one number, which when I look, looked at it was very alarming to, to me. In the last few years, there were coal plants that were installed, and about, um, I think, uh, more than half of the capacity was installed based on imported fuel, uh, Im Im imported coal. Now, with the global commodity pricing going, going up, and I think Goldman Sachs has sort of also come up with an indicator that we are not far from, unfortunately, three-digit oil, oil price. That is scary. Last year's um, coal price uh, import bill was over $1.2 billion, and in the morning we spent good enough time understanding the current deficit. So I think those are sort of very important things to sort of under, uh, understand. And also, again, bringing in another holistic view, Irina's report says that $1 of uh, investment in renewable energy saves about three to seven dollars in healthcare. We are all going through, and I don't know for how long we, we sort of go through this pan pandemic and the impact of climate, uh, climate change. So I would say we need to sort of re-collaborate ourselves. We need to see that, okay, how do we uh, sort of move out of this uh, situation of inertia? and look at solving the energy sector, power sector problem with an external sort of intervention as well. 
And I think it's so important to respect every stakeholder, whether it is an investor, whether it is the consumer, anyone who's part of a contract. And I think only, only by that way we can sort of move forward in the right direction. All the tools, they can be made available. I talked in the previous session about the $130 trillion climate finance and uh, I mean, it's, uh, that kind of finance that is com committed to SDGs. Um, when I think about power sector, I'll just end with one, uh, one, uh, one of my thoughts that I often think of uh, the South African Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission. It is very sort of detached from all of this problem. But in 1995, when South Africa set that up, that was to put all the stakeholders on the table and jointly find a solution. This is what we need to do with all good intention and only Great. looking in the future going forward. So, Great. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Claps for Raila. And uh, just concluding it because, uh, guys, sorry we didn't have enough time. There are certain points which require warranted more discussion, base load, and uh, the reconciliation because that topic is pretty controversial. But just to conclude, uh, one, two, three points that uh, we probably have to focus in the future. The fact is the power that we have, we have. The first thing that we need to do is to sell the power. I tell you, I have uh, work on the both sides of the table. So unless we sell more power, be at marginal cost, or we have to convince the uh, grid user at any price, there is no rescue in the future unless we sell the power. Two is the structure approach uh, uh, about four or five years to recover it. We have to address right now. I have shown you 2.4 billion a trillion recovery. And we should not keep our eyes for passing for another years. We have to start addressing now so that we can do it. Renewable, yes. And uh, thank you very much. I think uh, you wish to say. Absolutely. That is the. And I will this with this. I will add that everyone will do their own part. They will not do their own part. They will not do their own part. They will not do their own part. We will do our own part. If we do our own part, we will do our own part. So, inshallah, we will do this message. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. May I request all the gentlemen and the panel to please stay up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had some scary times and just as we enter 2022 with this new renewed hope that yes, we'll fix our problems in the power sector, the last year ended with a somber note where we saw a startling energy crisis in Lebanon. While there were just a few days and help has arrived, but yes, the crisis was years in the making. I love the optimism that has been displayed by this panel yet there are reality checks around us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move forward before we close this panel. We'd like to present this wonderful panel with a token of our appreciation. For this, once again, may I request Mr. Ali Akai, the chairman of Martin Dow Group, Air Chief Marshal Suhail Aman Sahab, who's the chief executive strategic engagements at the National Group, and Ms. Rabia Ahmed, the director and chief operating officer, Nutshell Group, to please join us up on stage. You've grown tired of all of us. You're not applauding our wonderful people who are coming on again. And to do the honors and present these books, may I request the CEO of Engro Polymer and Chemicals Limited, Mr. Jangi Piracha, to please join us up on stage. Jangi Sabot Shukriya for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, the first book we'd love to present this to, Sayed Munas Abdullah Alvi, the CEO of K Electric Limited. This was also news to me, by the way, that the K stands for Kinetic. So congratulations and thank you for being here. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, we need the academia and of course the corporate sector to collaborate more closely and influence the policy. Uh, please join me in uh, presenting the next book to Professor Dr. Fayaz Chaudhi, the professor and director at the LUMS Energy Institute. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, we need more luck in this department. It's always good to have luck on our sides. Next up, presenting this token of appreciation to Mr. Rohail Mohammed, the CEO of Lucky Electric Power Company.
Next up, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Ehsan Zafar Sayed, CEO of Engro Energy Limited. We'd love to present this as a token of our appreciation to you, sir. Trusted to bring in a fresh, vibrant outlook and of course the future is female. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker and panelist, founder and CEO of Planetive, Ayla Majeed. And last but definitely not the least, our honorable moderator for the panel, CEO of Capco, Mr. Aftab Mohammed Bhatt. Thank you, gentlemen. Ladies, may I request you all to please come together for a group photograph before this session formally concludes. May I request you all to please come together for a picture. I am trusting our key photographer uh, to choreograph this for us. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, gentlemen.